Most people think it's impossible to escape North Korea, but two men proved it is possible after a miraculous escape using just a bike tire, a pump, and a backpack. The craziest part is that these two men escaped North Korea right here. The North Korean leaders have recently made it almost impossible to escape the country. A couple thousand North Korean citizens typically escaped each year through the northern border, entering into China, and then made the long journey back into either South Korea or other free Asian countries. But the number of North Koreans who have successfully fled the country has recently dropped to under just 100 each year. With border crossings into South Korea and China becoming almost impossible, this has led North Koreans to have to come up with new, extremely dangerous and creative ways of making out of the country, and a man named Chul Eun Lee certainly wasn't an exception. Lee was a high-ranking North Korean government official who lived in the South Hwangi province. It was unheard of for a high-ranking member of the North Korean government like Lee to want to escape North Korea. A couple days prior to his escape attempt, Lee was surveying land for his government job on the coast along the Yellow Sea. While Lee was surveying the land, he studied the electric fences, landmines, and where exactly all the lookout towers were which were in place to prevent North Koreans from trying to escape. Lee felt he had a good understanding of the area and went home to try and recruit one of his most physically fit friends to join him in his journey to escape. The friend Lee managed to recruit was an everyday North Korean citizen who did not want to risk his life to escape, but when Lee explained his plan, the friend reluctantly agreed. Lee and his friend told nobody that they're going to try to escape, not even their families, for fear that this plan would somehow get leaked to the North Korean officials. It was now the day of the escape attempt, and Lee went to the nearby market to buy a bike tire and bike pump, two of the key items Lee wanted for his plan. He also gathered together food and stored this in his backpack. Lee and his friend waited until 8 p.m. and then made their way towards the Yellow Sea. Once they got to the final road separating themselves from the sea, they ditched their car and went out on foot through the high grass. There was no real way to go about this safely, so Lee and his friend made a deal where if the friend led his way through the landmines, then Lee would be the one to test the electric fence. Luckily, no landmines went off as Lee remembered a safe way of navigating through the high grass from his time scouting the area. The two men finally got to the electric fence, where Lee promised to be the one to test it, but luckily, this fence wasn't on at the time. Lee remembered from his time scouting that this electric fence isn't always powered because it's expensive to run electricity through the fence, and North Korea doesn't have the money to power this fence 24-7. Finally, when they got to the end of the landmines and through the electric fence, there was a gap between where they were and where the ocean was, but it was still too bright, so the guards surely would have seen them if they had made a run for it. However, they saw a big cloud moving closer to blocking the moon's light, so once that cloud was covering up the light, they made a run for it into the ocean. Once they got to the water, Lee's plan was to inflate this bike tire to use it as a raft to float on, but unexpectedly, the air pump wasn't working, so they had to make the quick decision to leave the bike tire and pump behind and start swimming out into the sea. The two men began swimming out into the sea, hoping to not be seen by the guards at the lookout towers on the coast. Lee estimated the swim to be about 3.7 miles from the point where they entered the sea to the nearest South Korean land, but the two men ended up facing far more than just this 3.7 mile swim. The men ended up swimming for two full hours until they decided they needed to lose some weight. They then removed all the food from their backpacks and even removed all their clothes except for their underwear in order to be lighter in the water. This helped for a little, but then three to four hours into the swim, Lee's friend was about to give up. The friend was having terrible cramps where he felt like his legs were basically paralyzed. Lee wasn't going to let his friend give up though, so with one hand, he was managing to stay afloat in the water, and with the other hand, he was massaging his friend's leg to make the leg cramps go away. This actually worked, and they were able to keep swimming. Now four hours in, and the men felt like they had been making some ground, but they saw a ship coming in their direction, totally expecting it to be the North Korean military. Frantically trying to get away, they spotted a small island about 300 meters away and swam as fast as they could towards this island. The island ended up being called Hambagdo and it was extremely small. They managed 
managed to make it on the island and then hid there behind some trees, waiting for the boat to go away. This took place on September 18th, when it wasn't very warm out, so you can only imagine how cold these two men were, dripping wet in just their boxers. Thankfully, there were some washed up trash along the island, so they covered themselves with this overnight to try and stay warm. The next morning, after a couple hours of sleep, the men were honestly too afraid to go back in the water. Instead, they took a couple hours on the island to use styrofoam that had washed up on the shore and wood to create a raft that would help them float in the water. As they were about to use this raft to get into the water, the same ship showed back up and they couldn't tell who it belonged to because there was no flag on it. They went back and forth between peeking to see if the ship was still there and then back to hiding on the island until the ship finally left. Soon after they got into the water on the raft and were rowing with their hands, a new boat started coming towards them and this time they figured the boat belonged to South Korea. Thankfully this boat did turn out to belong to the South Korean military who had been tracking them with infrared technology ever since the night before. The men were brought onto the boat and sent back into South Korea for questioning to make sure they weren't spies marking them as two of the few escaped North Koreans in recent years. Although escaping by sea is extremely difficult and dangerous, it has been done numerous times in recent years. Just in October 2023, four North Koreans were found in South Korean waters on a small fishing boat who escaped North Korea from farther up the coast. In May of 2023, nine North Koreans were picked up by the South Korean military, also in a fishing boat that had made it over the border and into South Korea. Korean waters. Escaping through the sea has been historically rare for North Koreans, however, for several reasons. First, North Korea doesn't have much of a fishing industry, making fishing boats generally hard to come by. The coastline of North Korea is also heavily patrolled by their government, especially as you get closer to the border with South Korea. Not only are there actual guards patrolling the coastline, but there's also landmines and electric fences, like in the story with Chul Un Lee and his friend. If you are able to make it onto the the waters of the Yellow Sea or the Sea of Japan, the water temperature here is extremely cold, making it only survivable for a couple of months out of the year unless you are able to stay in a boat. North Koreans also don't have access to GPS equipment or even compasses, making navigation difficult once you make it out onto the water. In fact, not only do North Koreans not have access to a GPS, most North Koreans have essentially zero information about any of the outside world. The North Korean government heavily restricts what their citizens are able to know about what goes on in life outside of North Korea. Independent media is banned so that citizens are only able to watch news that is owned by the North Korean government. All places of religious worship are banned. North Koreans aren't able to publicly assemble together in large groups and everyday North Koreans don't even have access to the internet. Most North Koreans only know about a couple other countries, mainly China and South Korea because they border North Korea, but also the United States because this is where the North Korean government puts all its blame. North Korean citizens are told by their state-owned media that the lack of food they experience and their struggling economy is all because of the United States. If anyone tries to speak out against the North Korean government, they will likely be thrown in prison or even in some cases, executed. On January 2nd, 2016, an American college student named Otto Warmbier was arrested in North Korea while he was waiting to board a flight to leave North Korea. Otto was on a guided tour were led by a Chinese company with 10 other Americans. At 2 a.m. on New Year's Day, 2016, Otto tried stealing a propaganda poster from the hotel that they were staying at that praised Kim Jong-un. Otto realized that the poster was going to be too large to take back to his room, so he left it on the floor right next to the wall the poster was on. Nothing happened there at that moment, but two days later, when the tour group was at the Pyongyang airport ready to board their flight to leave, two North Korean guards came up to Otto and tapped him on the shoulder. No words were apparently spoken, and they just let him away. Otto then got accused of subversion for the propaganda poster incident and sentenced to 15 years in a North Korean labor prison. Shortly after his sentencing by the North Korean Supreme Court, Otto went into a coma from a severe neurological injury where his brain did not receive enough oxygen. The North Korean government never announced this until 17 months later in June of 2017 when they sent Otto home to the United States. Otto unfortunately didn't have a chance at coming out of this vegetative state, so he unfortunately passed away just six days after returning home. 
the North Korean government takes any threats to their power extremely seriously, and in this case, even a poster coming down from a wall was enough to imprison and even kill an outsider. With very few outsiders coming into the country and the media completely controlled by the government, this leads North Koreans to have little understanding of what the rest of the world is like. Many North Koreans actually believe their country is in good condition where they have all their trust and faith in their leader Kim Jong-un. With very loyal civilians devoted to their government, there's not as many North Koreans who are desperate to escape. The only outsiders that are able to make it into North Korea in today's era are human traffickers coming in from China. In northern China, many Chinese will often sneak over the Yalu River and find extremely poor North Koreans willing to work. The Chinese will then recruit these poor North Koreans to come over into the northern side of China to work for a couple months and then send them home to North Korea. While working in China, these North Koreans are able to make roughly two US dollars a day, which is more than what they'd be making doing labor work in North Korea. These Koreans will work in China from spring to fall and end up walking away with about 330 US dollars for six months of work. There's three different types of North Korean men who cross this river into China. First is the group of North Koreans who actually get approved by the North Korean government to go work in China. Pyongyang and North Korea get a portion of the revenue that these official North Korean workers are able to generate. The second group are the North Koreans that seek employment in China without going through the North Korean government. These workers are in China privately and do not have to give a cut to Pyongyang, but they do often have to bribe Chinese officials. Lastly are the North Koreans who escape into China solely for the purpose of escaping North Korea. This group of Koreans do not intend on staying in China, but often have to work work here to make enough money to pay a local to get them out of China. Although many men do cross the border to work for the warmer months, men actually make up only 20% of these North Koreans getting human trafficked. Women make up the other 80% who get brought over into China for different reasons. Many of these women are actually victims of sexual exploitation where many of them are forced into marriage with Chinese men. There is a large surplus of men in China where the country is roughly 60% men and 40% women women where men look to other countries for finding their wives. These women will often leave North Korea willingly, not knowing that they will soon get forced into a marriage. Both North Korea and China deny this human trafficking problem as existing, where North Korea claims they haven't had a human trafficking case in over 50 years. The reason many North Korean women believe these human traffickers recruiting them to come into China is because this route is how many North Koreans have historically been able to escape. Although this has historically been the most common way of escaping North Korea, it certainly hasn't always been been the easiest. North Korea has a relatively warm relationship with their two border countries to the north, China and Russia. Both countries have never really had a need for many military personnel to patrol this border, unlike North Korea's southern border with South Korea. While North Korea's border with Russia is relatively small, just 17 kilometers or 10 miles, the North Korea and China border is massive, stretching 840 miles or over 1300 kilometers. This border mainly runs along the Yalu and Tumen rivers, winding through big mountains and very cold terrain. Koreans are able to cross these two rivers in the winter when they are frozen over and in the summer when the water level is low enough. But once they make it into China and Russia, they aren't any safer than they were in North Korea. Both China and Russia will immediately deport these North Koreans back to their country if they are ever caught anywhere in China or Russia. The Koreans' goal is then to make it to either Mongolia, Thailand, Land or Vietnam, as these countries won't deport the Koreans back to North Korea. Instead, these countries will send North Koreans to South Korea, where the South Korean government will automatically grant these people as citizens of South Korea. The number of defectors, this is another name for escaped civilians, that have successfully made it into South Korea is shown by this graph. The highest year for defectors was in 2009, with 2,914 escaped North Koreans before substantially falling off after 2011. The difference was that the old North Korean dictator, Kim Jong-il, passed away, and power got handed down to his son, Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong-un has made it much more difficult for North Koreans to even pass back and forth between the different provinces in North Korea. 
Kim Jong-un has also been investing in high-tech surveillance systems that are able to track movement along the North Korean and Chinese border without having guards line the entire border. A recent North Korean defector said that the drop in defections has nothing to do with better living conditions inside the country as it is purely because of tightened control and repression. Another massive drop in successful defects came in 2020 when the pandemic began. North Korea was the very first country to completely shut down their borders to any outside travel. The North Korean airport in Pyongyang only has two destinations out of the country in China and Russia which were immediately shut down and all trade with the outside world was also halted at this time. Not only did North Korea increase their security, but China and Russia also increased their security along their borders. China also completely stopped allowing North Koreans to come in for work-related reasons like they were once able to. North Korea also implemented satellite blockers, which made cellular service within the country impossible unless you had a government-issued device. With zero communication to the outside world, it's possible that many North Koreans never even learned that there was a global pandemic. The North Korean government also claims that their country did an exceptional job at defeating this pandemic, where they claim to only have 70 four deaths in a country with 26 million people. They also declared victory over the virus in August, just several months after the pandemic began and as infections were only still ramping up worldwide. This number is likely not totally accurate as North Korea was likely using the pandemic as a way to only increase their border security in and out of the country to the extreme level that it's at today. But this northern border isn't the only border where North Korea has been increasing their security. In between North and South Korea is a 160 mile long and 2.5 miles wide demilitarized zone. Although this zone is technically demilitarized, outside this strip is one of the most heavily militarized areas in the world. The DMZ was created at the end of the Korean War in 1953. North and South Korea are still technically at war, but this demilitarized zone ensures that violence at the border doesn't break out, or at least that was the goal. In North Korea, 750,000 military troops are deployed within 100 kilometers of the DMZ, ready if any violence breaks out, and on the South Korea side, they have 450,000 South Koreans within 100 kilometers and 20,000 American troops as well. Within the DMZ, there's thousands of landmines scattered throughout the miles of untouched land. When the demilitarized zone was initially formed after the Korean War, everybody living in this stretch of land was told to pick a country and evacuate the area except for two towns. Taesung is in the South Korean half of the DMZ, and a mile away across the border, North Korea's Kijong village, which translates to Peace Village. These villages haven't been able to communicate with each other ever since they split in 1953, and actually, the South Korean side would have nobody to communicate with, even if communication was allowed. That's because North Korean's Kijong village is purely a propaganda village to make it look like North Koreans are living in luxury. Nobody has ever lived in Kijong, even though the village looks vibrant and well put together. On the other hand, South Korea's Taesung does have residents, roughly 207 of them. South Korea is determined to keep Taesung populated, but living here does come with some very unique challenges. Whenever villagers of Taesung venture out to work in their rice fields, South Korean soldiers have to be there with them. These villagers are only allowed to leave their homes from sunrise to sunset, where they have a roll call led by the military every night once the sun goes down. When villagers have a friend that wants to come visit, the visitor has to apply for approval over two weeks in advance. Once that visitor finally gets permission to enter, as they cross into the DMZ, their navigation tools will all go black, where a South Korean soldier then escorts them to their destination. Taesung also has no gym, no restaurant, no no hospital and not even a supermarket. If a villager wants to order takeout, the delivery driver has to leave the food at the edge of the DMZ and then the villager has to go from Taesung to the edge of the DMZ to pick up their food, escorted by a South Korean soldier of course. There are some benefits to living in Taesung however. The residents of Taesung don't have to pay taxes and also don't have to be a part of the mandatory military service that the rest of South Korea has. Taesung also has new 5G cell service, which helps them better connect with the rest of South Korea. These residents now have an app that can water the rice fields without the villagers ever having to leave their home. 
At the village's only school, the students can now play interactive games and learn online. There's only 35 students at this school, and only 7 of these students actually live in the DMZ. The other 28 students live in the nearest village, Moonsan, where these students get bussed into the DMZ to go to school every day. This school is actually relatively hard to get a spot at, as they have 21 staff members for just the 35 students, and all the extracurricular activities are paid for by the South Korean government. Decades ago, villagers were stepping on stray landmines when they were out watering their crops and were even abducted by North Korean soldiers. The residents of Taesung often had to evacuate to underground shelters, but recently, everything in Taesung has been relatively quiet. What hasn't been quiet is just a couple miles over, the joint security area within the DMZ. The only place where North and South Koreans actually stand face to face is at what's called the joint security area. This is also the only space spot where North and South Koreans are able to communicate with each other. They used to communicate through phones, but in 2013, North Korea stopped answering their phone. Now, both sides use a bullhorn to shout back and forth between each other anytime they need to get a message across. The South Korean guards here are all required to have a black belt in Taekwondo and have to be over 5 foot 9. Here at the joint security area, there's a small blue building that stretches on both sides of the border where North and South Koreans are able to occasionally have a peaceful meeting. There's a concrete line that shows the border between the two countries. If you were to cross over this line into North Korea, the North Korean guards would likely take you away immediately. On July 18th, 2023, a United States soldier ran across the line into North Korea and was quickly taken away by the North Korean soldiers. His name is Travis King, and just before this incident, he was released from a South Korean prison because of numerous crimes he committed while on duty, including beating up his fellow American soldiers. King was soon going to be shipped back to the United States, where he was likely going to face more time in jail, but he booked a tour of the DMZ before his flight back to the US. On this tour, once the group had gone into the joint security area, King dashed over the border and got taken away by the North Korean guards. Nobody knew why King would have done this other than the fact that he must have been mentally ill. The United States still fought to get King back from North Korea, and 71 days later, North Korea sent King to China, where he was then picked up by the US military and brought back to a hospital in San Antonio, Texas. Once King got back home to the US, he says his reason for running into North North Korea was because he was disillusioned about inhumane treatment and racial discrimination in the army as well as inequality existing within American society. Travis King will spend many years in jail as he has been since charged with desertion along with eight other federal crimes including the assault of his fellow soldiers. While it's obviously extremely rare for anyone to try and cross into North Korea through the DMZ, it's also extremely rare for any North Koreans to try and cross into South Korea through the DMZ. There are some attempts though, most of which end up poorly, but in 2017, one man beat the impossible. A low-ranking North Korean soldier who has kept his identity private began his escape by attempting to drive a jeep down a road into the DMZ towards South Korea. Once he blew through a military checkpoint, the North Korean military knew this jeep was attempting to escape. This North Korean man tried driving over the dirt into South Korea once the road ended, but the jeep couldn't make it through the mud. He then got out of the car and tried sprinting towards South Korea. North Korean guards quickly responded and opened fire on the man trying to escape. They were able to hit him five times, but the North Korean man made it to a spot behind a wall where he was then able to try and hide himself under some leaves. The South Korean soldiers wanted to bring the man to safety, but they also didn't want to catch any stray shots from the North Koreans. Finally, 15 minutes later, the South Koreans were able to crawl to the man and airlifted him out of there to a nearby hospital. This escaped North Korean was granted South Korean citizenship like everyone else who escapes North Korea and has kept a very low profile ever since this day. This man likely wanted to keep a low profile as the family members of this man could be thrown in prison just because their relative escaped the country. This successful escape through the DMZ is extremely rare as only 20 North Koreans have escaped this way in the past 25 years. For now, because North Korea is getting harder and harder to escape every year with increased security at its southern and even northern borders, getting creative by escaping through the sea might just be these North Koreans' easiest option at finding a better life. Another group of people that got creative at escaping their own country
country is the Palestinians who are currently at war with Israel. Israel and Palestine have had a brutal rivalry even longer than North and South Korea and you can find out just how far back this rivalry goes in this video right here.